I'm Joanne, and it is my turn to teach this morning, so I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, looking at this passage, I think maybe God's going to do the whole thing. I don't have that many words to say. Mostly, we're just going to read what God has to say, which is my favorite kind of way of doing things. <laughs> so today's story is about, um, it's about growth. It's about maturing in faith. And you would think that after all we've been through in Exodus, that these people would have really anchored faith. But actually, they're kind of starting from not quite zero, but almost. Now, the thing that we know about actual spiritual growth, the, the, the real part of it, that's a divine work. God does that part. But what the Israelites are coming to find out is that the watering and the weeding, that's human work. And so God does the actual growth. We also participate. So what we're going to look at, um, I've got this uh, talk divided up into three parts. We're going to talk first about testiness. Then we're going to have a time of testing. And then we're going to find out what the true bread of heaven is. So starting out in these first few verses of uh, Exodus 16, about a month has passed by. For us, it only feels like a week. But for them, it was about a month. And the people had eaten through all their unleavened bread. They'd eaten through the animals that they had set aside for food. And now they were out of supplies. They were genuinely hungry. And they really had no way. They were in the wilderness. They had no way of getting food. So they were understandably upset. They were in great need. God had met their need at Mara. Would they trust God now? That's the question. Would they pray? Here's what happens. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, interesting name, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat, and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Um, if, if I didn't know that they were Israelites, I would have said they were Italians. But in any case, I think, pretty sure no Italians were in this bunch. Now, I want you to think for a minute about the waters of Mara. All right, that episode was in their recent memory just a few weeks in the past. And from that experience, they could have learned God has the love, goodness, and power to take care of us. They could have learned that God can provide what we need, even through miracles, even in this wilderness. They could have learned if we listen to God and do what's right in his eyes, he will heal us and keep us free from all disease. That's what they could have learned. What did they actually learn? If we complain bitterly to Moses, he'll get God to take care of us. Now, now pretend you're Moses. You're doing your best to rise to God's call. You've stepped into your destiny one step at a time over a year now. God's been working so powerfully through you that if it hadn't actually happened, even you wouldn't believe it. Incredibly, the mightiest nation on earth now lies in smoking ruins. Those who enslaved you are all mostly dead. Though it's true you have no home, and everything you own you're now carrying on your back, you know you're headed to a beautiful place, which will become your new home. All you got to do is get there. But now, an entire nation of hungry, bedraggled, Upset people whose life skills include making bricks have turned on you. They've hinted that you're either foolhardy and rash for bringing them out into the wilderness and killing them by accident, or worse, you've been intending to kill them all along by the slow and gruesome death of starvation. Now, they're saying they wouldn't have minded dying by God's hand, quick and sure. Like, you know, those boils. That was quick, wasn't it? Okay. Or any of the other things. Not really quick and sure, but that's what they're saying. We, we wish God had just killed us then. 
but they're miserable facing the prospect of dying by degrees of hunger and starvation. And they're saying it's due really mostly to you and Aaron's inept leadership. Also, by the way, have you noticed that they've created a false memory of Egypt? Back then, it was barbecue all day. We sat around pots of meat. We ate whatever we wanted. How quickly they'd forgotten the trauma and despair of their enslavement. Now, Moses doesn't seem to have been worried about this part at all. He had complete faith in God's provision because notice, Moses prayed not because he was hungry, but because of the people's violent anger against him. And notice also as we read this that it's not to the people's distress that God speaks, but to Moses' prayer that he responds. Let's see what happens. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Now, I want you to notice two things. Three, but really two. Notice God's gentle patience. Notice the word test. The people were to work together. They were to develop trust in God's provision. And the third thing is, they were to pay attention to this whole sixth day thing of preparing extra. Then Moses instructed the people. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. And I had to think about that. He used that word grumble quite a bit. Being critical and complaining can actually be a habit. And like any other habit, it can develop a well-worn groove in our brains and, and become such a habit that we feel vaguely uncomfortable if we don't complain, if we don't find somebody to grumble against and blame for whatever it is or be critical of. As a kid, uh, my parents were musicians, and they taught us, I was telling Dave about this this morning, they taught us how to discern every instrument in an orchestra and to figure out if it had made a mistake. And they trained us to listen to voices in a critical fashion so we would, I think what they wanted was so that we would learn how to do better than that. What's happened is that I can't walk through an antique store and listen to an opera if the soprano is shrieky. It just makes me like, ah, I can't do it, I can't do it, instead of enjoying it. It just becomes a groove in your brain. Our culture tells us it's healthy to blow off steam. Everybody heard that, right? Everybody's feels that that's true. Our culture tells us that that's a good thing. And, and it does sound good, because we know that if engines uh, don't release the pressure in them, they'll simply blow up. Our culture tells us that it's good to get it out. Tell the truth. Tell it like it is. But the thing about complaining and grumbling and, and even blowing off steam is that sometimes it's just quarreling. Sometimes it's not actually about the truth and telling the truth. Sometimes it's just indulging a sense of superiority or a sense of being a victim and not being responsible. Sometimes it's, it's just a sense of entitlement. So we have to be careful about it. Complaining and grumbling often just come from a self-absorbed perspective. I'm unhappy. I'm uncomfortable. And it's your fault. Jesus, Peter, Paul, James, and Jude all talked about complaining and grumbling in the Bible. So evidently it was a problem in the first century church. We all want to go back to the first century church, but it was a problem then too. It's the natural bent of our fallen human nature. So the truth was there was no food. 
The truth was they had no way of getting more food. The truth was they were in desperate need. But what they did with that situation, that's the balance. So what do we do? Well, the Apostle Peter put it beautifully. He said, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Grumbling actually distorts good judgment, and it feeds on self-pity. So you and I can just listen to what we think about all day long, and we can listen to what we talk about, and then we'll find out if we have this habit deeply engraved in our brains. Scripture provides a better way to deal with disappointment and fear and anger and hurt and betrayal. All the things that we do grumble about, Scripture says there's a way to do this. Instead of talking against God or against others, talk to God. Talk with others. And that's exactly what, what Moses did with the people's complaints. He brought them to God. I also think that's why God had three people in that leadership team, not one. Because they all needed each other as wise ears to help the other leader gain perspective. All of us fall down in this, but all of us need each other to, to give us not only warmth, not only hugs and comfort, but also perspective. We need balance. So our question really at this point is, what is the balance between our complaining and grumbling and our critical talking and our talking with God and wise other people about it? Well, that brings us to the time of testing. Now Moses spoke with the conviction of the Holy Spirit in his words, I think. Would the people repent or would they harden themselves to what God was telling them? Here's what Moses said. Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, did you ever wonder if they had loudspeakers? I don't know how they did this. Say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight, you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. Now catch that. They were to look in the desert. They were to watch that pillar of cloud and fire. How could they possibly doubt God's goodness to them and his mighty power to provide as they watch that cloud and quail appear on the horizon and fly right down to their feet? I don't know, they had little signs, please eat me. <laughs> How could they doubt? When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. Pay attention to that. Do you see that? Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. There were some people who couldn't gather. There were... Surely pregnant women, there were surely babies, there were surely people who were frail or aged, people who had disabilities. Take an omer for each one in your tent. Manna actually means, what is it in Hebrew? It's like kangaroo, what is it? Everyone who was able to was to gather manna each morning until the sun melted the manna away. And then they pulled it together, what they'd gathered, and incredibly, every person ended up um, with an omer. Now, the Apostle Paul referred back to this story when he was explaining to the Corinthians about how to take care of each other and be generous to each other. Did you know that? Isn't that an interesting thing? Here's what he said. Our desire is not that others might be relieved when you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written. The 
the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Isn't that interesting? Once a week, they were to collect and prepare twice as much manna in order to rest the next day. God was beginning to teach the people about the Sabbath. Now, you and I know that God had established the Sabbath on the seventh day of creation, but it's possible they didn't know that. So he's going to teach them now. God's test, unfortunately, was very short-lived. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the Omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Who was angry? Moses. Moses was angry with them. Not God. Moses. Why did the people not listen? Well, as survivors of abuse and trauma, maybe their mistreatment by leaders all their lives made it hard for them to trust God or Moses. And actually, this is the typical mindset of people who have had a history of abuse and betrayal and neglect. Foster children, uh, often foster children who have been abused or neglected, will squirrel away food even though they've been reassured by very kind and loving foster parents that there will be plenty of this next time. You will never go hungry. They still squirrel it away. They still eat as much as they can because that's not how they grew up. So they don't know. I know what your lips are saying, but I can't count on that. It takes them a long time, months. Months. To understand that it's the truth. We'll take care of you. Now, the Israelites had grown up in a culture of slavery. It was their whole mindset to believe that they were at the bottom of the pile, that nobody had their good interests in mind. They were just tools. They were suspicious and cautious. They were afraid someone might get more or take their share. But when they tried to hoard, it became rotted and it grew maggots. I thought, what a great mind uh, metaphor in the scriptures for what happens when we're full of fear and anger and, and, and sense of victimhood and, and, oh no, they're going to get me. It's just rotten. It's rotten. It needs to be cleaned. It needs to be healed. And, and I had to ask myself, when has my own mistrust of God spoiled what he had in mind for me? Trial and error. Now the people knew they couldn't hoard and withhold from each other because it was just going to get rotten. It's going to backfire. So now, each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses, and he said to them, This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil, and save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Now, did you catch the instruction? Was there going to be any manna on the ground on the seventh day? Should they go out and gather? No. All right. What really happens? <laughs> Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. So think about it in this way. Just as God was testing the people, so the people were testing God. Was his word trustworthy? Was he going to be consistent? Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and keep my instructions? God's test was to teach Israel that they did not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Their daily bread was a gift from God, and they were to live in daily dependence on him and daily generosity towards each other, which brings us 
to the truth for this section, God's response to our need is his provision with a call to obedience. God continued his instruction. Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. So just as obedience is the right expression of faith, so faith makes obedience possible. It's like an organic feedback loop. The way manna was sent to the people, they were required to rest in assurance on God, that God would provide. They were required to gather it every day, what was sufficient for that day. That's how faith is made strong, to live it out every day. So God is gracious in the same way to us today. He feeds us, and he requires us to gather and to be generous to each other. It's a lesson that's timeless. It was important to remember God's love and his goodness and his faithfulness, third section, and power. Here's what happened. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. Thousands of years later, Jesus explained the secret of the manna after having fed 5,000 people. Happens in John chapter 6. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, Always give this bread. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Stop grumbling among yourselves. Jesus answered, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, They will all be taught by God. This is Jesus still talking. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat, anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is the true bread from heaven who gives eternal life, not just daily life, eternal life. So I had to ask myself, when my soul feels hungry, what do I take in? And I have to be honest. Sometimes I take in things that are not so good for my soul. Taste good, aren't good. Jesus said he was the bread of life for hungry sinners. Food for the body is necessary. God took care of that, and he will take care of that. But what you and I really need even more is food for our soul. And Jesus becomes a part of that, a part of us, through his words, but also through his spirit, his presence within us, in our lives, and through prayer. We experience that. First, you and I take him in, but then we live it out. We take him in, and then we live it out. We read his words. We obey his words. We pray and listen to him. The divine work is happening. Our character is changed. Our motives change. Our ethics and values change. We live it out. Moses wrote these last lines uh, of this chapter, I think kind of as a retrospective. I I see him towards the end of his life. He knows they're nearing the promised land finally, um, so he's going to put this all together. And he says, uh, so Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. 
As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law so that it might be preserved. What you see there on the screen is also Aaron's staff. We haven't got there yet. Uh, the Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. And Omer is one-tenth of an ephah, which actually doesn't help us much. I have no idea what an ephah is. But <laughs> at that time, that was helpful. Uh, so, so the reason why I claim that, that besides that the Bible people claimed that Moses wrote this, you see what he said here. He said that they ate this for 40 years until they got to the edge of Canaan. Well, here's what really happened. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Moses would never have known that. Joshua wrote that. So it's just a tiny clue for you guys, bibliophiles who love that kind of stuff. I do. The point is, there was no manna raining from heaven. There wouldn't be for another 2,000 years. The secret of the manna would not be revealed for another 2,000 years. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God was patient because he knew the people. He knew their trauma. He understood what was happening inside them, all the damage that would need to be healed. God's response to our need is his provision with a call to obedience. That same God is patient with you and me today. He teaches us his way and he provides for us, sometimes even with miracles. And we respond with learning and living out his way every day. Jesus is the true bread from heaven who gives eternal life. As we pray, as we read his word, as we experience his nearness, as we live out what we're learning from him, he nourishes our inward being. And he matures us. It's happening. Oh, Lord God, how thankful we are for such a tender and good God, mighty and powerful to save, mighty and powerful to raise up to new life. Send us forth today and help us to learn how good it is to receive from you every day and to be generous to each other. Amen.